So uh, this is not gonna be a long presentation or a lecture, so don't worry. Uh, so this is the flag of Afghanistan. Uh, I don't have to explain it because there's no time. And this is the map, this is Afghanistan. So if you see, there's Afghanistan and there's Turkey. So they're pretty close to each other, if you guys didn't know. And this is Barbados, where I currently live and where I'm currently speaking from. And this is somewhere around this part of the world, you know, very far from Turkey and Afghanistan. So basically I come from this city, Kabul. Um, it's a pretty ethnic city, you know, with some modern uh, twists in it. And it's a pretty city. I hope some of you may get to visit it someday. David was there in 2004, 2005, I guess. And uh, so Afghanistan has a very, uh, you know, uh, history that dated back 5,000 years ago. And these are some remnants from Alexander the Great, the Citadel of Herat. And there is the Buddhist statues. It's very famous and it's a trademark for Afghanistan when someone introduces Afghanistan. So basically it's from the time that the Buddhists were here in Afghanistan. And then came the Islamic era. And these are some examples of the Islamic architecture. This is the blue mosque of the Mazar Sharif. And this is the minaret of the Jam. It was also an architecture of the Islamic era. And then we move to some monuments that are pretty uh, related to the modern era, like the Darlaman Palace. And it's an architecture, it's a German architecture. Actually it depicts the modern conversion of Afghanistan. But these monuments were destroyed later in the war. But now there are renovation of these monuments, such as the Palace of Bahman. And this is the monument of Ahmad Shah Abdali, the founder of Afghanistan in Kandahar. Now, leaving the history aside, we don't need that. Uh, we'll talk about the nature of, in Afghanistan. So Afghanistan is pretty in a crossroad in Asia. So there is a lot of different climates in Afghanistan, such as the tundra climate, the snow, and people used to ski in this area. and different species live in this area. There are green valleys and uh, there are desert areas, especially this area that I'm actually showing you is called Banda Amir. It's the largest lake in Afghanistan. There's another picture of it. And this is the Wakhan Corridor. David has been there, he told me. And it's a very beautiful place, very green. And there are some areas that are mountainous and perfect for skiing and these types of sports. And this is, these are some pictures from that area. And as usually that Afghanistan is depicted in media, there are also some deserts in here in southern parts. So now talking about some species that are rare and only specific to Afghanistan, not specific to Afghanistan, but to this region, Central Asia. One is the snow leopard. They are very endangered species. Uh, there's the uh, alpine tiger. There is the brown bear and the Marco Polo sheep. There are some uh, endangered species that are being hunted and they must be protected. There is the pistachio tree. It's very popular in Afghanistan and I uh, put it here because pistachio is also very popular in Turkey. So there are some climates uh, that are similar between Turkey and Afghanistan. So these trees can grow in those places. And there is the saffron, the main product or export of Afghanistan. And Afghanistan saffron has been the world number one since 2012 or 2011, I don't remember. And also there's a lot of ethnicities in Afghanistan, such as the Tajik people, and there's the Pashtun people, and some of uh, the people, that's actually a guy from Nuristan. So there are a lot of diversity in Afghanistan. And talking about the food, there are a lot of uh, similarities between Afghanistan and Turkey, especially the kebabs and the, uh, uh, and the rice, the brinch, you call it, right? And this one is especially the bottom right one is called mandu. It's a very popular dish. And there's actually a similar dish in Turkey too, but I don't remember the name. It's burak or something like that. This is a specialty. It's in the new year. It's called Correct. afmeva. Yeah. So this is called afmeva. It's actually made up of seven uh, dried fruits and it's a very delicious dish. But actually this is a specialty for a festival in the new year. And also the famous sports in Afghanistan that's only specific to Afghanistan and it's played nowhere else. It's buzkashi. It's like a polo, but a very brutal type of polo, not a civilized one. <laughs> so yeah, this is my presentation. So hi guys, good morning. So sorry for the phone ring. So my name is Abigail Johnson and I'm 19 and I'm from Barbados. So as you've just seen, really, Barbados is like very small, like 166 square miles small. 
So you just know you saw it just looks like a dot on the map. And that's really and truly kind of how small the islands in the Caribbean are. So as you may or may not know, we're small, as I just said. So the impact that we can have on climate change may not be great or it may not be significant, but it does not mean that we should not try. So for Barbados, we are surrounded by water. So I don't know how close you guys are to the ocean or if you guys can see it, but we're basically, everywhere you look, you can basically see ocean. You can see sea. And that's one of the biggest tourist attractions for us. So how um, climate change is having an impact on us really is that as sea levels rise, I don't know if you know, you guys know about the coral that surrounds the ocean, but as the, <laughs> I see someone say, why is everyone 19? But anyways, as sea levels rise and as the ocean temperature rise, it damages the coral that surrounds Barbados, not just Barbados, but other Caribbean islands. So we are relatively flat as well. So when the coral is damaged and we, we are prone to having a hurricane season every year, you have the waves, instead of they, them being blocked by the coral, they come higher. So we are more at risk now for tsunamis and as we are flat, it can damage the shore, like the, the buildings on the shore because we have a lot of hotels and houses on the shores and it can also damage the mainland, the mainland places, which would be the towns and stuff like that because we are relatively flat. So although we, the Bar well, Barbadians really, I, one thing I would say to you guys as youth, because I'm a part of a small country, is not because you believe that you may not have a big impact or because you believe that what you're saying is, is not important, but still try because a little difference can make, no, can make some difference. So what I will say is that during winter, there's, the snow was a lot in the past, but now it got lesser and lesser. Like we don't have that much snow anymore in Turkey, in like Ankara. So I, I guess it kind of sucks because we don't have that much snow anymore. But what I realized is that there's more trees. Like they start to plant a lot of tea trees into the city. So Ankara is uh, in a very, I mean, it's uphill. So compared to the rest of Turkey, compared to the sea level, it's really high up. So uh, it was very normal for us to see a lot of snow, very thick and very heavy snow during the winter. And the temperature doesn't really get that high. And um, the main problem of the city that I find is during the past years, it has become more and more polluted. So um, I lived in Ankara when I was small and because my parents uh, are both ambassadors, we always move around and I, we came back. And what I have noticed from my youth and now is the uh, difference between the air quality uh, about the trees. They, plant, they started planting a lot of trees. Um, Turkey has a project about uh, planting a lot of trees that they have recently started, where uh, they uh, started to quote unquote preserve the, um, the greenness, say, around um, the city. And um, that still doesn't change the fact that the air is getting more polluted. We have noticed probably many of us, uh, at least I have, I don't know about the city since uh, I don't live in like the center, but um, in the outer parts of Ankara during the uh, pandemic going through, the air had become a lot bluer. I'd say the sky, it was more gray. It was a bit grayish, dirty. You know, the snow you see on the sidewalk uh, in winter color. Um, you can tell us uh, why you think it is important for you to participate and share their voices as it relates to uh, climate change and the impact that it's having on persons' health or just global issues in general. Um, so for me, really what is important to youth, well, for youth really, is because in the next 10 or 15 or 20 years, we are the ones who are going to be living on this earth. We are the ones who are going to be reaping 
the rewards for what was sold. So although we may not be, as young persons, we may not be the persons who are contributing the largest right now, we still have to advocate for our futures. We have to advocate for our health. And we have to advocate for better health, not only for us, but for the future generations. So I think it's important for young persons to get involved, for young persons to, um, to speak their mind, to, to get for, for better situations, really, because... If we don't do it, who will? And it shows a lot of unity, really, when young persons can come together for a common goal, for a common purpose to, to get, to achieve, um, to achieve something. And when it's done, it's really commendable. So that's just my short thing. I totally agree with what was previously said. And I'd like to add that um, most people are probably waiting from my age. I mean, I see some of my friends say this. And that uh, we didn't create it so we should not be the ones running after them and i and i agree like we shouldn't be the ones who are running after the um mistakes that the past generations made however we cannot they they are not changing they will not probably change uh they haven't done anything since now even when it comes to their attention because that's how the past generations have been brought up and that's why it's important for everyone like we don't have to all do perfect um green we don't have to live the perfect green life. We just have to contribute here and there to make a change gradually, but a change that will be good for the planet and that will essentially make our life qualities go up in the future for, you know, the ancestors will probably have. Well, uh, you know, the future of every nation is dependent on their youth, on their education. So if we don't uh, educate the youth properly from now on, they are going to be the next generation, maybe in 20 or 30 years, the whole population of the earth is going to be replaced by this generation. So if this generation is going to be ignorant and, uh, you know, uneducated, because education doesn't mean go going to school only. Education is all about the skills, experiences, and the way someone thinks. So if that uh, way of thinking is not proper, uh, the next generation is going to be the same as this generation that we are fighting with, with because of the uh, their policies regarding the climate change and everything. So yes, uh, but my uh, approach to uh, climate change would be different than uh, it currently is because only raising voice uh, cannot, uh, you know, change something. So everyone has to come up with a creative solution to every problem that they think they can uh, solve, you know, uh, because uh, the people who don't care about the climate, they are benefiting from them. And if you just force them to do something, uh, they'll just ignore you the way they are doing it for the past maybe centuries. So it's up to us to do something because, you know, drop by drop, a river is formed. There's a saying like that in my country. So if every person contributes a little bit by an innovative solution, at least we can have a less carbon footprint maybe by another 10 years. It doesn't matter if it's big or it is huge. If it's only like a small bit, it still contributes and it might still save some lives, you know? And uh, currently in the chat, I was arguing that uh, people are hesitant to do these things because the effects are going to be long-term. And that's one of the reasons that, especially in my country, people don't, uh, uh, try to solve problems that are related to the climate, you know, because they are focusing more on their short-term problems. Like uh, I have stated in one of my interviews that um, uh, people in Afghanistan, because some people are poor, they don't have money in the winters because it's an extremely cold winter. So people try to burn anything that they can find, like uh, rubber, plastic, and everything to keep themselves warm. So this creates a very dark sky, you know, you can literally see in the sky and it's like a black cloud over the city and the pollution gets way worse in the winters. So the problem for that is that they can replace that with a sustainable, sustainable energy source. But the problem is not that, you know, the problem is that these people are poor and if they don't burn that thing, they're going to die of cold environment. So they don't care about the environment if they're going to die because of a lung cancer or something else in another 10 years. Their, their main concern is that they're going to die from cold at that moment. So there are different problems that have underlying causes. So those causes should be addressed, you know, before actually lecturing them on climate change and everything. 
So this is just my take on the climate change. For me, to combat climate change is not simply for to educate, but we have to um, try to change some of these circumstances that persons are in. Because I think in the, Car in the Caribbean, at least, there's one in four children who live in poverty. So when you have one in four children living in poverty, the, the ramifications of something like that is not positive. And the actions that have to be taken by those persons to, to have some sense of safety or st stuff like that is not going to always go in line with protecting the environment. So try to combat areas such as those can also lead to positive improvement in climate change. So in our school, when we used to go to school before the pandemic, we will do like projects. We will do big. Uh, we will do big postcards and uh, put them all over the school. And lastly, there was a woman from a association in Turkey, and she came and she showed us things that we could use that will that that was environmental and that will be better if we use them. And um, some of the bigger classes, the high school classes did a project. So uh, for one week, they did different projects like they planted uh, flowers uh, and then they did compost and all that kind of thing. So when we used to go to school back then, we used to do many activities uh, to learn about the environmental issues. That, that, that's great, yeah? Um, because yeah, just, just yes, yesterday we were speaking with, um, with a group of young people from, uh, from uh, Ivory Coast, uh, Sierra Leone and, and, and Barbados about um, some green school projects. Um, Ashley, maybe you would like to share a bit of, of what we learned yesterday from those students, no? Of, of what kind of activities are planned in, in, in their schools on the environment. So basically, guys, all that was discussed yesterday um, as it relates to healthy lifestyle living um, in the context of climate change was that we realized that there's a distinct link between some of the projects that are being done in Barbados and some of the projects that are being done in Sierra Leone. So we were basically talking about ways in which um, in schools across, in our countries actually, that there are various types of environmental programs where students not only build, uh, while participate in, our, in the agricultural sector, but in the context of creating healthy lifestyle living and healthy environments for children. As a medical student, uh, the ideas that I can share regarding this matter is that, uh, you know, um, usually people um, focus, when we talk about climate change, they only focus on trees and green plants that can prevent the global warming and maybe the health issues that's caused with people. Actually, when we talk about environmental pollution, it doesn't only mean that the air is polluted or maybe the water that we drink is polluted. Actually, everything that is surrounding us, they may be polluted in some way, and we have to have a knowledge of that, you know, to prevent that. Let me give you an example. Usually, the paints that you use to uh, paint the walls of the house and etc., the beds and everything, they usually contain lead, and it's a very poisonous, heavy metal, you know. It can cause uh, different types of anemias in people and can cause cancers, and uh, it has very toxic effects on plants, you know. Uh, it can stop germination, it can stop seed growth and root elongation and everything. So this is just an example. There are a lot of pollutants in our environment, not just in the air and the water, that can cause uh, these problems. So if, the, if people are educated regarding these things, they can prevent them because there are also alternatives for the paints that are lead-free. 
and everything and there's also pesticides there's there's a lot of things surrounding us that can pollute the environment not in the traditional way that we think of but in a way that can uh, harm our health in a long term so you know rather than changing the big things maybe sometimes focusing on the small things can have a bigger impact on the life um i i uh, I'm just going to give like a very kind of irrelevant uh, example, but um, I do oil painting uh, quite often and uh, some of my friends don't know that you are, you should not ever uh, throw down the drain uh, like mineral spirits that you use to clean your brushes when you do oil painting. And uh, I saw someone who actually just drains those down the drain and that's not the correct thing to do since it's very highly toxic. And a lot of things around us like that we find in our houses are not meant to be uh, just thrown out or like, you know, poured down the sink. And I don't think like that's a matter of, oh, it should be known because these things are not taught at like our schools and stuff. Say, um, I think it was um, Umut who gave uh, the, um, talked about our school and how it, um, how they educated the people. But I kind of like to disagree. I don't think our school really has a good way of educating people on climate change and environmental issues. As much as there are teachers who try to bring up the subject, uh, it is most of the things are not given to a class, but it's just casually on the walls of the school. And like we know the students in our school, like most people don't care, don't read those. And they just keep on doing the things they do normally. And for the one time they actually gave a speech about it, it was to a very small group of students from different classes. So it was not uh, like a general thing that everyone had uh, known. And uh, many people don't know the actual impacts of those things. Many people don't know the dangers of those things. One of the main issues currently regarding these things that people don't uh, put much focus on is the a general uh, genetically modified uh, food products and products that have hormones in it. And you, you guys might have noticed, especially in the Western countries, the teenagers nowadays are like, look like 20 years or 30 years old. They're, they're like big, like trees. That's what I have noticed. These are just the side effects of those hormones that are injected in the food and uh, the uh, GMOs that are causing certain type of cancers. So these are just environmental pollutants that can uh, affect the health in different ways. The other problem is the radiation, the radio waves, you know, because uh, this is the age of technology, so uh, people are using phones and laptops and everything everywhere. So there are antennas everywhere and there's constant radiation. And this has caused a lot of problems and a lot of cancers because in the last hundred years, the rate of cancers because of these radiations have gone way up and uh, there are very congenital malformations in children and pregnant women will have uh, women will have complications because of these things so these are some minor environmental pollutants that are not in the classic way so as ray said they can have a lot of impact on the health you know as the final goal it, it's the health of the human beings you know and other species so these things can fatally affect the health like uh, Idris talked about like uh, how teenagers looked very old and they looked older than their actual age. And I also think that for young children, for example, at school, uh, we give them, for example, acrylic paints or uh, types of paints that are formulated with chemicals that can form harm. harm. Most, I mean, like ac acrylic paints don't usually smell, but they do have fumes that could be toxic if they're inhaled. And a lot of students actually use those paints for their projects and are exposed to big amounts of it. Or for example, uh, I see a lot of people in our school, like young girls who do makeup. And uh, some products they use are not good for uh, their skin. They contain chemicals that are typically not meant for skin, but because they use very uh, drugstore and things you can find, uh, you know, high street makeup, it's uh, not good for them. For sunscreens, for example, uh, when we go to the sea or for in summer, uh, it's they most people don't know that it's really bad for the animals in the sea. Or um, I see a girl use a foundation who is based with a product who is not really meant to be on skin, 
And when you breathe that in, it's essentially just right under your nose. So you're exposed to an entire day and you put layers and layers and layers of it on your face, which is really unhealthy. And that's what people are not like young kids and teenagers are not educated on. Uh, the products that are exposed to these children and they're exposed to these teenagers don't have proper um, indications on what could be done and what could happen to them if they're exposed to it for a prolonged amount of time. Hey, I'm Lisa Roach and I'm Leticia Roach. We are the Hey Ambassadors for Beautiful Island, Dominica, which stands for Healthy Environment Friendly Youth. Do you know that climate change has a lot of effects on human health? Here are some effects. Extreme heat contributes directly to death from cardiovascular, respiratory disease, heat stroke, and can trigger asthma attack. Unhealthy air quality can cause watery eyes, coughing, difficulty in breathing, and lung cancer. Floods. Floods can contaminate our fresh water supplies and heighten the risk of waterborne diseases. Let's come together to have one voice for climate justice. Because any harm done to the environment is harm done to humanity. We are here. Uh, I'm a human, and I uh, just wanted to, you know, for the sake of all of us Earthlings out there, just wanted to say, We love the Earth, it is our planet, we love the Earth, it is our home, we love the Earth, it is our planet, we love the Earth, it is our home. Come on everybody, I know we're not all the same, but we're living on the same Earth. Are we gonna die? You know what, Bieber? We might die. I'm not gonna lie to you. I mean, there's so many people out there who don't think global warming's a real thing. You know, we gotta save this planet.